Did you know that the mobile phone is often a family's first introduction to technology in the developing world? This is the Lovers of Exchange podcast. I'm your host, Jimmy Gia. Today's guest is Natalia Pšenichnaya. During her time at the GSMA Foundation, she was instrumental in helping global telecom companies hone new business models in agritech, meditech, and climate tech. Season 3 is brought to you by a generous grant from the Skoll Center for Social Entrepreneurship at the Said Business School, Oxford University. If you're new to this podcast, please don't forget to subscribe. Now, let's listen to how Natalia's empathy for the world around her made her into an unwavering pioneer to improve the livelihoods of those most vulnerable to climate change. Natalia, thank you so much for joining us today. It's a pleasure to have you. It's very nice uh, reconnecting again, Jimmy, with this uh, very special occasion, and I'm very excited about contributing to this call. So one of our good friends from our MBA class has often spoken of how much she looked up to one of your qualities, which is the fact that you are a vegan. And you have been a vegan for such a long time. I would like to just start by asking, what are some of your favorite vegan recipes? Oh, wow. I think just a correction there. I think I, I've been a vegetarian for a very long time and being vegan is a bit more recent jump <laughs> up the level in terms of complexity of lifestyle. I really enjoy Deliciously Ella cookbooks uh, that you can find in the UK. She gave me a lot of skills, so now I can DJ with the vegetables and use the right ingredients and go off script and it will still be nice. Two of my favorites are uh, the Sri Lankan curry that you make with the sweet potato. And the second one is the um, mushroom stroganoff that is nice. Also a reminder of my Eastern European roots, I guess. So, uh, <laughs> we do like mushrooms a lot. Both of them have incredible flavors, intensity of flavors and subtlety of the umami when it comes to the actual cooking and the flavors of the food. Definitely, yeah. And what was it like growing up in Russia? How did your childhood growing up in Russia influence some of the way that you approach your work today? It wasn't easy being vegetarian 20 years ago in Russia. It's very different right now. <laughs> so I was more of a pioneer rather than inspired by Russian culture to be a vegetarian. It was super hard being a vegetarian there, just for a record. Like you would come to the restaurant and if you ask for vegetables, they will ask you, what's your main you have to get the fish or meat if you also want the cauliflower. So you can't just get the cauliflower. So I think right now, if somebody is complaining in Russia that it's difficult, I would say it, it was much more difficult. And it's good to, have, to be a pioneer sometimes in the long run. It actually works. And I think my explanations to my friends that I'm doing this because we're going to change the demand patterns in the long term made them laugh at the time. But actually, it happened 20 years later. It became much more normal. And I think for me, it was more of a inspiration from nature and just you know, being out camping with my family or taking kayaks and boats for a week sometimes in the rural wild areas and just really being in touch with that adventurous side of me is still there and still influences how I make decisions. I think when I'm in the nature, I really see why we need to make an extra effort. Starting off as early as you did, being a pioneer certainly didn't hurt when you went into your professional life and had to then continue to push the boundaries in agri-tech, meditech, climate tech within the telecom sector. So tell us how you fell into the telecom sector. How did you start your career there? When I was still in the university, so I was doing part-time work while I was uh, still finishing my master in economics. And the part-time work was in the company in St. Petersburg that was providing technology for remote monitoring of businesses, uh, shops, enterprises, or private properties, or cars, <laughs> so kind of moving objects. That's what at the time was called machine-to-machine -machine technology and now became an IoT, Internet of Things. 
from there transitioned to uh, one of the largest telcos in Russia. I was working on new products and services. Unfortunately, many times those new products and services were more of like income generating group as opposed to the services that should help <laughs> the the society. So quite often it would be like games and puzzles and prizes that you can win if you text a short code and like I got quite a good understanding of what drives telecom decision making what the C-level people would look at when they're making projections for the next year, where would they put the money, where they wouldn't put the money. So actually, that was quite useful later on when I had to speak to the C-level decision makers and speak their language and show the understanding of the pressures that they have and helping them to maybe frame the opportunity to pursue more innovative mobile services using the right language, using this as a competitive advantage in the long term as opposed to doing something just because, you know, it would make us feel better. After a few years in um, value-added services, as, as it was called, I transitioned to uh, Oxford, where I met you, for an MBA. And to be honest, I didn't think I'm going to come back to telecom because I was so disencouraged by the money-making philosophy idea that doesn't allow anything else really and I on the side was volunteering and organizing my own environmental activities such as beach cleanups and uh, like plastic recycling and just tons of activism kind of activities which were very scattered and I knew I want to do that for majority of my time but nine to six was my time with telecom helping them to earn money from selling ringtones so that didn't really match in me <laughs> so I was really hoping with with MBA that I would be able to I didn't know how but just transition to an impact space can you describe for us what is GSMA as an organization yeah, it's an interesting organization that started as a um, kind of industry body for different mobile operators around the, the world to help different operators agree on the same common standards of the networks. So if you roam, if you move between country to country, like your phone is still working, but it's working because those companies have spoken to each other and agreed to use the same base technology. And so GSMA started as a... Um, trade body really helping to uh, keep these conversations at the industry level. It eventually also uh, started lobbying on behalf of telecom industry and is lobbying a lot even now for spectrum, for example, or taxation. And it promotes innovation. So if uh, one operator, let's say somewhere in India, figured out a new model of powering the base stations in a more efficient way, that we would encourage or we would have encouraged them to share this in least commercially sensitive way to the rest of the members so that the whole of the industry benefits. And this was done through um, a set of knowledge activities so different publications or events yeah about 10 years ago so gsma understood that actually they also have a power to use all these connections and networks to reach out to the underserved in developing countries and actually there is an appetite from governments and private donors as well to experiment in that space and that's when the foundation was set up so gsma also has a foundation creates and runs and executes the programs that work with telecom partners to deliver social or environmental impact on the ground using the business KPIs to help them understand why they're doing that. And certainly when you got to GSMA Association, you fell into just the right mix of the impact product innovation as well as using your deep understanding of the telco sector. Can you elaborate a little bit on what your role was at GSMA? So I started uh, by working on one agricultural project in Kenya. So I was based out of there for two and a half years and really trying to prove the concept of delivering information to farmers through the mobile phones. 
things that now maybe you know seem obvious 10 11 years ago were not that obvious neither for donors nor for business community nor for investors in fact people had the questions of you know would farmers even trust this they don't know who they're speaking to especially if it's automated information we don't know what they're looking for what kind of questions are they going to ask how can we make money out of it so it was really the what i was there like one of the first people working in digital agriculture space at the time it was called mobile agriculture it was an amazing time because if you met another person working in that space you immediately became friends and you stayed in touch and you helped each other as much as you could because we were all figuring out how it can possibly work and of course now it's a much bigger crowded space with venture capital coming in and so many different use cases and business models and new technologies way beyond just mobile information through the mobile phones but it was very challenging and incredibly rewarding experience that's when i understood that agriculture was not really only about social impact but also about environmental impact in the deepest sense because in climate change right now affects not us as much as communities on the ground in in asia africa and latin america on the other hand the way we do agriculture and the way we consume food dramatically changes the biodiversity and the climate as well so let's talk about the motivations behind this intersection and this nexus of telcos and climate justice why do you think the telcos became interested in impact broadly but then specifically we're also talking about health agriculture climate so how does telcos then view impact it's a very good question and the reality is they don't think impact they think competitive advantage they think can i be the first i think i'm missing out because somebody launched an interesting product and there is demand for it and it takes a lot of education and that was one of the main roles of my team and gsma mobile for development team to explain to the decision makers that there is an opportunity in the impact space but the impact space should be married with the commercial opportunity otherwise you are unfortunately stuck on the route of working with the uh, csr departments for a little bit we were all excited about csr reality is csr departments working from one sustainability report to the next sustainability report they want good stories but they do not have strong kpis which are measured and monitored on a monthly basis by the chief strategy officer or ceo and they don't have big budgets neither they have big teams so if you want the large company to seriously approach a new opportunity you have to talk to chief marketing officer or you have to talk to chief strategy officer sometimes technology guys like depending on the structure of the company another very big area right now is the mobile money in the telecom space and the telcos are now set up um, more and more Kind of separately from the mobile money business so you might want to engage the mobile money business ceo or c-level sponsor um, because mobile money is currently one of the biggest contributors to growth of telecoms because the penetration of the mobile phones has kind of almost picked in many of the places and mobile money is still perceived as a future opportunity. So eventually we were able to find business cases that are tapping on this need to grow mobile money base. And interestingly, in the rural areas, this is where mobile money make much more sense for lots of transactions and lots of financial products because this is where the banks are not traditionally reaching out and uh, for agriculture for example one of our key value propositions for if they digitize the supply chains they would be able to put all the cash that is currently 
moving through this kind of grayish agricultural space onto the mobile money networks. It's either them or eventually it goes to the banks. So I think this is where we got the aha moment and they say, yes, I want all this next wave of customers who want to be paid for what they sell, who want to access savings and credit, who want to maybe eventually pay for electricity in schools. We want them to do it on our network using our mobile money. And this is when they became interested and said agriculture can potentially you know, be a big business case for us. You know, and, and it's fascinating to hear how we think of telcos, we think of industries really as operating within their swim lanes. But what you're demonstrating is that even within these large industry sectors, they're starting to bleed into other sectors and compete. So like telcos competing against banks and so on and so forth. Do you see that evolution of, you know, competing outside of your sector as something that we're going to get more and more of? through IoT and through the development of technology. Definitely. I think the challenge there is that you cannot pursue five growth opportunity areas at the same time. You have to bet on one of those horses because the amount of money available for innovation or R&D is very limited. You have to do that pitch to the CEO and the budgets are quite slim, depending, of course, on the group of the telco. And some of them perceive, let's say, electricity and clean energy and pay-as-you-go energy as uh, like, because this business case has been already proven as a safe place where they can start putting more investments. For some areas like healthcare, the business case is super difficult. So this is where you would have the biggest challenge convincing them to put money in it. When we talk about agriculture, it's it took me 10 years <laughs> to, to convince people to understand, to like even start calling it an opportunity area. So I think definitely there will be more and more challenges for telcos because they are more and more challenged to grow outside of the core competency because they are not really that great at IoT. They are not great at product development. They don't know energy sector very well. They don't know agricultural sector very well either. So they need good partners. And I think here it comes down to overall strategy. Are you trying to build products yourself for the industries you don't understand? Are you trying to just provide an enabling layer and allow others to connect through the APIs and do whatever they please to do? Or you build strategic partnerships and still use your brand and still use your name and put a little bit more meat in the game and try to create value and capture more of that value yourself. And we have seen all three different strategies. Well, let's go back to your early days starting in agriculture tech. When you were talking to the farmers on the ground in Kenya, what were some of the key problems that they would reveal to you? That is a very good question, potentially could lead us to this environmental justice conversation. Even 10 years ago, when I was on the ground, one thing that became apparent is that farmers do not know when it's going to rain. And that's a big problem because traditionally they were planting on the same week of the same month just as the parents did, just as the grandparents did. And right now, it is a very risky way to do things. Go out of your house and decide, because it's first week of October in Kenya, I'm going to start planting. The seasons have changed dramatically. And even if there is a prediction that it's going to rain tomorrow, it doesn't mean it's going to be sufficient rain to start planting. The cost of mistake is very high because you purchase seeds and potentially fertilizers for putting those seeds in the ground. Those come from your savings. You put those on the ground, the rain doesn't come, and all those seeds are dead. You have to buy them once again. You might not have another bunch of savings readily available and you might actually have to go into debt to get another bag of seeds to plant again. And this is just the planting. If you talk about long term, I think farmers are really confused right now about is the rain going to be enough for the crops that I'm planting. With the climate change, the same crops that farmers are currently growing at the altitude, at the plots, 
in several years will no longer grow in that area because the temperatures are shifting. So if somebody is growing coffee right now with certain altitude of like 1,500, they won't be able to grow coffee in the same place in five years. And they don't yet know about this. That is where the biggest challenge to the rural communities comes from. And we're talking about smallholders. Yes. These are independent farmers who own their own plot, maybe one to three, five people or so yeah. in each one of these yes. plots. And so they're just subjected to these massive shifts in climate as their crops basically within less than one generation, within a decade, are going to be completely shifted to a different crop. Absolutely. In the best case scenario, it'll be shifted to a different crop. And I think that actually makes me very nervous because they are not fully aware of the worst case scenario. They're hoping for the best. I can't say they can rely on the government unfortunately, to inform them and prepare them because even now they lack critical infrastructure in terms of roads, any sort of storages where they would be able to put the crops and let's say survive a price shock in the market. They have to get rid of the crops immediately after the harvest because there is just no cold storage available and there is no savings, insurance or credit available to them. So all the risks that they are taking in farming is is their own risk. They can't hedge it. And we are slightly oblivious to how big this problem potentially is in the long term. Where does then telcos come in to improve this situation? And what were some of the initiatives you worked on to bring technology? One of the key examples would be uh, the weather forecasting that I have given an example of before. So just offering farmers a reliable weather forecast for the next five days can dramatically reduce their risk. And that was one of the things that we encouraged telcos to introduce in their portfolio. So why could telcos do it and why couldn't another sector do it? What was unique about telcos? Yeah, I think you're hinting at the enabling part of the technology. I think the reality on the ground is that the farmers we're talking about, smallholder farmers in Asia, Africa, they wouldn't have a computer or access to an internet. They would have a very basic phone or a Chinese secondhand phone. Uh, no-name phone without even operating system you or me would recognize uh, without ability to just check the you know latest news and that's the only technology that exists in every single household right now there might be one phone or two phones there might be teenagers helping their parents to navigate and understand how to maybe use Facebook or to read for that matter because farmers might actually not be able to read in English even if it's an official language they would be able to speak their own tribal language or one of the languages in the country but they might not be able to read so this is um, not definitely a replacement of a critical infrastructure but it's a definitely a leapfrog for lots of products and services because now with the mobile phones we can't just reach out and deliver information but it can be two-way communication system where farmers can say what they actually want and need and ask their questions they can send money through their phone they don't need a bank account which is another complexity of course in terms of regulation but it's possible in many countries right now of course for some percentage of population mobile phone is the first access to internet as we know it. This is the first and only point. This is how they will experience internet. And I think for us living in very urbanized, developed countries, we're spoiled by technology that tells us within a feet or two of where we are, everything that we could possibly want to know. When we get to these rural communities where it's a not smartphone with the lack of the telecom infrastructure, lack of satellite infrastructure, There might only be a couple of data points in your entire country, which is nowhere near the granularity you need to be able to know how rainfall affects my plot of land. You're hinting at another big problem in terms of infrastructure, which is the weather records 
we don't have them for developing countries. We don't have them enough. In Kenya, there are 40 weather stations. Just to kind of explain how ridiculously small that amount is, you can say that Kenya has islands, mountains, snow caps, deserts. 40 weather stations is definitely not enough to be able to tell a smallholder farmer for their microclimate what is the historical, what is the prediction. It's not relevant to them. They can get the weather forecast for maybe a capital city uh, on the radio, <laughs> but that's not what really is going to happen to, to them on their, on their land. And one of the amazing things that we have seen telcos possess is actually data on the strength of signal between different base stations that apparently is a very good proxy to the uh, rainfall. And we started working with a couple of telcos, like example is MTN Nigeria or Dialogue in Sri Lanka. They have taken historical information from the base stations about the strength of signal. And in the places where the signal was weak, there was interference. And interference means there was rain. And the two base stations couldn't really speak to each other with like that much clarity as they usually would. That recreated the weather patterns. And we compared them with the satellite and the actual weather stations on the ground run by the Met Office in Sri Lanka and it was much more accurate but also perfect correlation was observed. Really really hopeful that without needing to install more weather stations we can have a business case which, which would unlock this massive opportunity to get access to historical weather data which is essential for us to be able to predict anything into the future. What was it like when you're starting off in Agritech what was the North Star that kept you committed and focused and honed in on a telecom opportunity within climate and weather? I think it's, yeah, just the unique position in the industry that we had it really made you feel like there is much more that you can do. But definitely, telecoms are not the only players. They are providing an infrastructure which is essential for many startups which are appearing right now and just using the ability to capture data, send data, get the mobile money payments done and are using telecom infrastructure. So we're really broadly talking about technology. I have worked with NGOs and the startups and medium-sized companies as well that use different types of tech it can be uh, super basic, it can be a little bit more advanced or IoT related, but definitely telecoms right now are providing that essential infrastructure, like a backbone, because we really don't have anything else in Africa at least. There are many other players, and I think there is a space for uh, venture capital and foundations and uh, any other type of private impact capital to seed more innovation in technology and impact space. It doesn't have to be telco driven, but you need to be very well aware that telcos actually very often are gatekeepers to that infrastructure. Or at least you need to be aware of uh, the regulation that is enabling uh, innovation in certain places, but is not allowing it to, to happen in others. It raises an interesting question of what's the role of these enabling technologies to energy justice and environmental equity. At the end of the day, the telcos themselves are not farmers, but yet without them, these smallholders can't adapt react and change. So what do you think is that role of the enabling technologies to climate change? I think it's a very opportunistic role for the lack of a better word because if you have an urgency to act and support the community and you have nothing else but you have the technology, you use that. Once we would be able to reach to everyone by internet, like we wouldn't have to go through mobile phone. I think the role of this technology is very neutral. It can be used for good and for bad, like the same way we see it in developed countries. There is lots of concerns and harassment happening online and it's happening on mobile to women in developing countries, which unfortunately prevents them from getting access to essential services because their husbands and households are concerned. 
for their safety. They don't want them to have a phone. So I'm just giving an example how technology on its own is just there. It's an enabler. It will be used for good and for bad. And I think it's really a question about our role as a community of forward thinking business leaders, like how we want to use it while safeguarding the customers and beneficiaries. It hints at how societal acceptance of technology lags behind the technology innovations themselves. And so the technology is neutral, but the application of it from societal acceptance is itself a problem to tackle and to be aware of. I think you always have that. And this was a very, very interesting way of developing new products. You don't develop for farmers. You develop for the early adopters. You understand how your early adopters are, and you understand who are the ones in the community that's going to be the last ones to start using the technology. And you can do it through like deep on the ground kind of community-based research through like lots of conversations and understanding aspirations of different people. I think that was a really very helpful way of, of building products. When in Sri Lanka, you go onto the ground and you talk to different farmers, you would always find the progressive one the one that really wants to earn the trust of the community and wants to be helpful, they will walk around and knock on different doors and ask how they're doing and share latest information and the news. And what the cousin who like lives in a big city just told them, they want to lead, they want to show by example, they'll take risks. They're the ones trying new crops, they're the ones trying new technology, and those are the ones you want to start promoting the new way of using technology and showing the rest of the community that actually you can dial a short number and listen to um, almost like a real-time show with agricultural experts but there would be the farmer and you we can't blame them there are people who actually are trapped when we were doing segmentation we had farmers falling into that category being like we genuinely don't know when they will start using technology and actually Maybe there should be many other fundamental changes happening in the market first before they will feel like taking those risks. Because if you are the farmer that doesn't have support, is not educated and on the brink of the poverty and has only one crop, they don't feel like risking it and trying to get new information from somewhere else. They will be the laggers, they'll be the last ones. And it is heartbreaking sometimes to see it can be a women farmer. It can be like an older, especially an older uh, generation of farmers feel extremely uncomfortable because they're not even literate. I'm not talking technological literacy, I'm talking basic literacy. And if they get the phone, they just use it to uh, stay connected with their family. I think it's important to say that innovation has a role, but I think government still has a role. (laughs) They need to support the communities. And unfortunately, I'm not seeing enough of that. Mm -hmm. Did you see any similarities between working with the farmers and then what you did with medical health? Were there parallels and lessons that you were able to bring over to that? Yes and no. I definitely felt that from the design perspective and usability perspective, the way you deliver services is very similar. You have to speak plain language. You have to make it as accessible as possible, as little steps to access the service, to register as possible. So there are lots of lessons and similarities because it's the same group. And actually, it's the rural people who lack access to healthcare. But in terms of like the bigger ecosystem, there's a very different industries. In agriculture, you have large supply chains and supply chains have powerful buyers that actually have money to spend and they make public commitments to us right now about SDGs and about sustainability and anti-slavery ambitions and climate resilience and all of those things which is happening through, for example, carbon disclosure project, CDP, has uh, supply chains like Mars committing 
to reduce the environmental impact, but also be more climate ready and support the farmers. So you have businesses with incentives, whether those are public incentives, investor driven incentives, whether those are like just efficiency and reducing cost, and you can work with them to drive innovation. In healthcare, you ultimately end up with the government because there is just not enough private healthcare in developing countries to work with. And the most vulnerable people are not going to have access to private healthcare. They're reliant on, on the government again. And unfortunately, the government is not ready to make an investment in the healthcare infrastructure first, as we all have seen, unfortunately, in the last year. Neither they are ready to upgrade and even just make the current weak infrastructure efficient by using more telehealth, using more technologies just to make the existing medical centers and existing doctors more accessible and just allow people in very remote areas have access to basic advice. So I think in terms of impact, both spaces are highly impactful. Making something work in digital health in developing countries is extremely difficult if you don't have a government buy-in. But then you have other examples like Rwanda. In places like that, you have a hope. You have a government saying, we actually don't tell health for everyone. We just need a couple of those. We need South Africa, we need Rwanda. We maybe need a couple of countries in Asia that can demonstrate how much more efficient the healthcare system can be, that actually they save in money in the budget rather than just spending it. And that hopefully in the long run will bring more governments onto this roadmap to digitization. But unfortunately, that's a very, very slow uh, project. It seems like you dive head first into these projects as the pioneer in so many different things, going back to you know your diet as a kid to now being one of the first in agritech and one of the leaders of meditech. What do you consider to be your primary skill when you think of the different projects that you have worked on in the past? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, I think strategic skills is something that allows me to see a few steps ahead and beyond that being able to transmit that strategic idea or a concept in a clear articulation to my team and my partners and the founders. <laughs> Those two together are essential. So when you say communicate, transmit to the different partners that you work with, how complex was this interconnected web that you had to work within? I think it is very, because it's a different, it's different spaces. People think very differently. People in healthcare think one way. People in telcos think completely different way. Energy providers think on different level and the KPIs on the like energy efficiency as opposed to climate. So you have to find a common narrative, but very often you have to bring the people at the same table, kind of drop this common narrative and make them talk to each other. I think it's also about this facilitation skills. But very often we would create the same business case just for different audiences, it would be even different publications. The case to becoming a digital supply chain in agriculture was presented completely differently to a mobile money provider as opposed to an agribusiness. For mobile money provider, we've been talking about this is how many more mobile money accounts you can get in your country. This is how much cash you can digitize through your network. This is how many of them you potentially can convert to people who start to use derivative products like savings and credit. And then when we talk to agribusiness and we present in the same case before they agree to sit at the table with a telco, we talk about you need to save cost in uh, your supply chain. You need to know who your farmers are and you would never know who they are unless you start tagging them digitally and have records. It's not safe to just send a truck of cash with machine guns into a rural area because this is how we currently pay farmers. You have to speak appealing to their problems and for that you first need to listen and understand what their problems are. Just being a mediator or being in the middle is a very interesting task but if it 
if they start understanding each other, this is where real innovation can happen because innovation happens in this intersection between different industries. For sure. And sitting in the middle of systems means that you have to be that translator. Yet at the same time, when you sit in the middle of systems, you're surrounded by a lot of inertia of people not wanting to do something. So how did you realize that you had leverage to make change within this tangled web of multiple systems? To make a change, you don't have to work with everyone. You just need to find one or two pioneers that are willing to risk it. And then you bring the others by showing them an example. And that's when they start feeling like they're missing out. You say, actually, your competitor in the same market already launched a product for farmers. Sometimes you don't even have to tell them. Sometimes you just find out they already launched a competitive product. And that's the best news for us. So you really just need to choose the ones that are risk takers, again, early adopters, and speak to them their language and use the incentives of limited opportunity and being helpful to them. You need to give them something that actually will help them internally convince the AC level management as well that it's a good idea. You know, with all these stories that you've gathered in the last few years, what would you say is what you're most proud of, of your time at the GSMA Foundation? One project I'm more proud of than others. It's a project in Pakistan with mobile operator Telenor. It's the best team I've ever worked with, the most hardworking, dedicated, risk-taking, smart people who worked with us uh, for a couple of years. We've provided risk capital, but we also offered them what you would call technical assistance, but literally it was like a kick in the bum to get into the car and go to rural areas and meet their own customers within frameworks of understanding how to interact with them and what to ask and how to bring those insights back and build the product out of it. I have never seen such excited team when those guys came back from the ground and said it was the first time we understood that the majority of our customers in Pakistan live in rural areas. We have to do something for them. We are the biggest operator they're gonna be much more loyal to us it's a win-win situation and with that understanding but also with understanding what farmers really needed they built a product called 7272 and it became viral they didn't even have to market it that much they reached 10 million customers out of which 80 percent were active on a regular basis i've never seen that i'm coming from telecom space i've never seen 80 percent activity rates on telecom products so getting a viral product at that scale that actually delivered impact and was super easy to use for the farmers was the biggest achievement, I think, for me. And a few years later, when their competitor, Jaws, went onto the ground to do research with farmers and ask them, do you use your mobile phone for agricultural needs? Most of them said, yes, I use it for 7272 with Telenor. And when you have that level of adoption, this is when you see you can make a change at a national level within a few years. If you do it right, if you work with the right business player, you offer them what they need and help them to move faster and help them to also get enough sea level visibility. You know, it goes to show the importance of seeing the tangible effects, whether it was you in nature as a teenager to whether sending these telecom employees out to see their customers. There is something about that tangible Connection. personal experience that changes the way we serve our customers. Absolutely. Yeah. When you jump into something new, you know, like one of these new projects that not just you haven't done before, but no one else has ever done before, what do you do first? You do your research. <laughs> you do your homework. Whatever you can find, right? If there is nothing out there, you go to the customer. You have to do your homework. I don't think you can act out of on assumptions. Even if you write down your assumptions, just call them hypotheses and verify them. I think just homework. Yeah, I, just as generic as that. I am a big believer in, in homework. It annoys me a lot when, when people talk about things that they haven't made an effort to read about. One of the things that actually that we found very helpful and we got really good feedback from the industry was to create the toolkits that allow businesses to develop products 
from scratch. Nobody has ever done it in that market. They can take that toolkit, go to the customers, and they can go from deep research and insights to ideation to prototypes to the product. So we actually created that process where they can just do the cutout of a paper phone a screen of a quick simulation and play with it and we got really good feedback from private companies using that they said that it actually really helped them to navigate this complexity when you were the first to a student or early professional today what skill or expertise do you encourage them to learn personal resilience <laughs> Sorry for laughing about this, but I think in the COVID time, that's when we realize it takes much more than knowing about innovation curve or funding curve. It actually takes the best of you to keep going forward and making sure your team is okay as well. This is something they don't, or at least they didn't teach us at the business school. How do you stay mentally prepared and healthy for challenges like that and i think just a deeper inner awareness and any sort of tools around meditation and stress resilience and just knowing yourself and knowing how to reset and come back to what you're doing to the important things is essential if business schools can start introducing those more kind of soft skills development i think it would have a very good long-term impact for the future leaders. I think if you just work in a commercial environment, in the leadership position, that's tough enough. But if you care deeply about what you're doing and you want to see an impact and you're going through a lot and a lot of challenges, it's even harder. Just passion is not going to solve it. You know, you have to know when to have a downtime. And when to allow your team to have a downtime and be compassionate. And I think those are things that I learned outside of MBA in my last 10 years. For sure, good life skills to have, to have that passionate resilience. Natalia, thank you so much for your time today. It was a pleasure to get a chance to chat and to learn about some of your wisdom and insights. It's a pleasure. Thank you for listening to the Levers of Exchange podcast, where we share ideas, knowledge, and best practices for achieving a sustainable future. I'm the host, Jimmy Gia, and the music is by Sean Hart. Thanks again to the Skoll Center for Social Entrepreneurship at the Said Business School, Oxford University, for sponsoring Season 3 of this podcast. Please subscribe to our podcast for new episodes and share with a friend. Please visit our website at www.leversofexchange.com for additional episodes, books, and other resources. Thank you again. And remember, the clean tech economy will require everyone's participation. How can we exchange ideas today to help you find your role tomorrow?